I'm afraid you guys are hurt. It's a Sabbath school. This morning we have the honor of hearing from Dr. Henry Lamberton, who is one of the deans of the School of Medicine and um, a highly respected member of the School of Religion faculty, too. I know him as Dr. Henry Lamberton. Uh, Forrest Howe has a more profane name by which our speaker is known. One that I've never heard used, and it seems to me inappropriate. But uh, we'll, we'll let Forrest take over and talk about that, because you folk know each other from even, even earlier than I do. And it is a four-letter word, by the way. <laughs> it's Hank. <laughs> I knew him when he was Hank. That's right. And, uh, the, reason I, and the name Hank has a special chord in my heart. Is my father was named Hank in the in the shop. Everybody, when they went in there, they got a nickname. Now my father's name was Farrell. Now how they ever got Hank, I have no idea, but. My grandfather who worked in the shop, his nickname was Johnny, and his real name was Forrest. So, figure that out. So whenever I hear Hank, I think, so, but come on up here a minute, Dr. Lamberton. Uh, Hank is fine. Uh, there's, a, there's a woman over here I've been friends with for, oh, yeah. since, uh, a lot, since I was in probably Pretty third cool. grade, oh. and she always calls me <laughs> Hank. Well, there you go. So. Well, I know that's what we called you at the okay. seminary. Okay. Right? Yeah. 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 I don't but, know how it changed. Okay. Well, and by the way, I I go through those stages too. If yeah. one day somebody called, uh, this was several years ago, and they wanted to talk to Woody. Oh yeah. And I, my wife says somebody wants to talk to Woody, and I said I don't know who that is, but it's somebody from a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, but where are you from originally? Uh, a little town. You got it. Oh, I got to turn this on. Yeah, you got to turn it on. Right, right, right. There you go. A little town. Uh, in the northwest part of Washington called Brewster. Brewster. And if you've heard of that, there are people like uh, the Winslows here who make jokes. Why would they do Brewster, that? Brewster, Brewster. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I lived in Worcester. Worcester, okay, yeah, yeah. It's up there, up about uh, near Wenatchee in, in that area. If you okay. Know. Okay, and uh, you lived there, I mean, you grew up there, and you, lived, you went to school there. I was born in Alaska, but okay, moved we, there when I was one, and grew okay. there all my life until, and, uh, until I went away. And Margaret Margie was four or five grades below you. Was a very good friend of my oldest sister, right? Oh. And I was best friends with her brother. Okay, there you go. Okay, and um, tell me a little bit about Brewster. Uh, oh, uh, Brewster is uh, it, it's a town on the uh, kind of the big bend of the Columbia River. Okay. It's right on the river, uh, and it's mostly apples uh, growing there and some wheat. Okay. And uh, kind of a mix of uh, well-to-do farmers and migrant workers. Uh, did you go to an academy? Up? I did. I went to Upper the Academy. Oh, and that's in Spangle. Near, Sp near, near Spokane, yeah. Spokane. Anybody else go to Spangle? No. Jerry Winslow, you didn't go there. Jerry went to several academies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, since I have the mic, I'm going to say Jerry was actually expelled <laughs> from at least one academy. Right, Jerry? We don't need to talk about that, oh. do we, Jerry? Let, let's go into that in detail. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then you went to Walla Walla? Right, Walla Walla. And then you came to seminary where I knew you. Yes. And there were several of you from Walla Walla. I mean, uh, 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 was it Jolla? Jolla. Jolla was yeah. there. Rob Lord. And a guy named Horse. I can't remember his name. <laughs> Dennis Weissong. Dennis Weissong. And then... Greenman or Greenwald? Greenwald, yeah. Greenwald, yeah. okay. Well, yeah, and, then, and then you went and pastoring. I know you worked with uh, Roger Heinrich for... Yeah, I pastored in, in the Upper Columbia Conference for uh, seven years. Worked in Spokane and, and okay. little wheat fields in, uh, of Othello and then Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Okay. And then when did you end up... Then I went to Walla Walla College and taught in the School of okay. Theology. Okay. And then I came down here in 1987. Okay. And you took uh, your additional training at Fuller Theological Center. Okay. 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 And uh, and you right now it's, you've had this you you've been stuck with the same job for years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell my kids you're with a job five years. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but what, what do you do? This is my 26th year. Uh, I, I'm the associate dean for student affairs in the School of Medicine. Okay. All right. And at this time, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, let's have prayer. <clears throat> Father, I pray that our time together today will be a time of reflection, of thinking what it means to be Christian in our world today in your uh, let me just say a word about the handout. I saw a poem uh, the other day uh, called Sheep, and the opening line was, the sheep adorn the hillsides rural and is both singular and plural. It gives grammarians the creeps to hear one say a flock of sheeps. And uh, so I quote that because some people get creeped by formatting on papers. And if you're one of those, just kind of try to try to bear with it. This is put together uh, from pasted and, and copied and pasted in the time I had from a number of documents. I'll tell you why I'm doing this. Um, I made the mistake of leaving a handout that I use in class, one was for a physician's class, on this desk. And uh, I think it was Laura Allick who found it and said to, to uh, Dave Larson, we should have Henry talk about this. <laughs> So uh, that's why, that's how this came to be about. And um, it's, it's in the context of, of, a, of an introduction to the class Wholeness for Physicians, where I used to talk about this. I haven't in the last few weeks, but I thought a few years ago I went back and did it this spring. And, and when we talk about conceptions of wholeness and cultural conceptions of what does it mean to be whole, what does it mean to be a whole person, uh, and that's certainly an emphasis in, uh, in, in, our, in our university. So um, I, I um, for, for a cultural, uh, really quick overview, I, um, I've talked briefly about some commonalities between Sigmund Freud and uh, Carl Rogers and, um, uh, and then C.S. Lewis, as a, or sometimes used Henry now as a, as a representation of Christian faith. Um, so I want to leave some time for discussion. So I'm going to say something that interests me um, as, a, as a psychologist and a pastor. First of all, um, when we talk about people like Sigmund Freud, uh, uh, B.F. Skinner, Rolla May, uh, they are people that are sometimes categorized as personality theorists. They're, they're, and for uh, and personality psychology, which tried to give a global uh, picture of uh, a human person, was popular uh, in the 60s, 70s, and maybe a little bit in the 80s. It's largely been abandoned. You still read textbooks on personality theory because it's so global and so big that uh, it doesn't fit efforts to be objective and empirical and scientific, which which uh, psychologists want to, uh, try to do. So uh, psychologists today look a lot more at cognitive psychology, perception, everything from single cells to larger systems. But um, it's still very much in the heritage. Now the reason why I think it's still worthwhile talking about today is because although these ideas are not posture, promoted in, in, if you take a doctrine in psychology, they're very much alive in the culture today. And, and that's the point that I, I want to make today. First of all, when we think about uh, uh, Freud, if people don't know anything about Freud other than this, they know that he had a tripartite view of human nature with the id, ego, and superego, right? That's something that people generally know. And um, um, the id being the uh, primitive impulses that uh, are not filtered by conscience or social propriety. Uh, and the superego, it's kind of called conscience, but it's not exactly conscience in the Christian sense. It's basically the part of us that was socialized by culture, by our parents, whatever that is. And, and uh, so that was the, 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 uh, the, e the superego. And the ego was conscious awareness. And the ego tries to modulate between the id and the superego. And the ego also tries to get the id to be civil. Uh, and to, to behave in ways that are, are, are socially appropriate. Now, the point I simply make there, and which lots of you could say, and I, I've written some of this, Freud's understanding of the tension in the middle of the first page between the demands of the superego, which he attributed to the internalization of society and parental standards, and the person's innate desires and impulses, or the id, 
support the conclusion that the experience of inner tension or guilt is a universal experience. It's not clear whether Freud ever thought we would get over that battle between the id and the superego. Some people think maybe he thought you could get healed from that, but it seems more likely that he just thought that was a condition of human beings, that we, we live with that tension, that sense of, of, uh, of what we want to do and what we ought to do. Um, I want to just say what was Freud's, Freud did have a theory on how what we could do about human nature and the problems of human nature. And um, I've, uh, I'm going to re uh, refer you to a book. Uh, some of you may have seen it. It's been around for a while now. Uh, the Question of God, C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud debate God, love, sex, and the meaning of life. This is by Harvard psychiatrist Armand Nikolai, who used to teach a class at Harvard on Freud in the medical school. And then uh, he said that many of his students wanted some balance or off-limit due to Freud's atheism. And so he started reading C.S. Lewis, and he taught a class for quite a few years on Lewis and Freud to the medical students in, in the School of Medicine. And it's, it's a fascinating book. He's been here on campus, by the way, maybe some of you quite a few years ago. We had a PBS series on this. But this is what he says. Armin Nikolai quotes uh, statements from two of Freud's letters. Quote, our best hope for the future is that intellect, the scientific, is this kind of just the way it is? Or? Pull it down. Just down, down okay. Okay. Down, just. Let's see if that's enough. I'll do more. Our best hope for the future is that intellect, the scientific spirit, reason, may in time Okay, we'll go on now. May in time uh, establish a dictatorship in the mental life of man. In a letter to Albert Einstein, who had written to Freud asking what could be done to protect humankind from war, Freud responds, the ideal condition of things would of course be a community of men who had subordinated their instinctual life to the dictatorship of reason. So that was his, his, uh, his solution. But it's interesting that later in his life, toward the end of his life, and remember that Freud witnessed the war, World War II, Freud increasingly became aware of the limitations of placing trust in human reason and insight. Uh, Nikolai refers to Freud's observation about the evils brought on by Nazi Germany, one of the most educated nations in the world, which had, brought, had one of the most educated, highly educated fighting forces in history. And so Freud observed that, and he also said in a letter to a friend, just towards the end of his career, regarding the apparent lack of moral benefit from the study and practice of psychoanalysis. And this, this is a significant quote. The psychoanalysis has not made the analysts themselves better, nobler, or of stronger character remains a disappointment. Uh, so that was kind of his conclusion at, at the end of his life. Um, now, Freud's uh, theory was followed uh, historically by behaviorism with Watson and B.F. Skinner, which basically uh, denied all of the, uh, moved away from this inner psychic study and said we need to what, study what's objective. And so they emphasized studying behavior. Uh, and uh, I won't get into behaviorism now, except to say that behaviorism was followed by, what's, by another wave in, in psychology, which is called the self-actualization movement, human humanistic psychology, the humanistic the human potential movement. And its champions were Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, Roe May, Eric Fromm, and others. I remember when I was a freshman at Walla Walla College, we were reading Roe May and, uh, and Eric Fromm. And that was cool, you know, he was, he was a, uh, a uh, very, very influential people. Um, and this is the ba I want to spend some time going over their basic theory of human nature. Freud, uh, if you read his book, uh, 19, uh, a book called On Becoming a Person, which is the first book I read by him when I was in college, uh, he, he gave a, a talk at the University of Iowa, or Ohio as I recall, and uh, his talk was, and it's, you can read it in the book, um, he was talking to a group of university students, and he said, what is the meaning and purpose of life? He took on big topics. And, uh, and uh, he, then he summarized different types of answers to that question that have been given in history. 
uh, the religious answers, the hedonistic answers, so on, and uh, to that purpose. And then he says, to me, the purpose of life is to <clears throat> be the self that one truly is. And that was, <clears throat> that was, his, that was his answer. <clears throat> now, um, so that, um, and, and, and under, uh, underneath of that, was his belief that, um, that if we were our true selves, if we were the selves we, tr we truly were, that deep in our beings we were by nature pro-social and, uh, uh, and, and we, would, we would relate to others in positive ways that are positive and constructive. Now, Rogers believed that the devel and, uh, developing an awareness of the free flow of forces within oneself was basic to understanding one's self-experience, which was for him the ultimate source of truth and meaning. And um, he says that neither the Bible nor the prophets, neither Freud nor research, neither the revelations of God nor man can take the precedence over my own direct experience. Some of these are capitalized, that's me, just to, just to not read everything in this paper. In Rogers' theory, lack of congruence between various aspects of the self is largely responsible for failures in living and for mental suffering or discomfort. Uh, Jones and Butman uh, summarize Rogers' theory, and uh, that, that Rogers, Rogers said that whereas Freud, with the Ed, saw lots of different motivational forces or impulses, that he says, for me, there's just one basic motiv motivational force in human nature. And that's the force to self-actualize, to be the one self that one truly is. Now, if that sounds a little bit like that's ambiguous, well, uh, just deal with it. Okay. Uh, but he said, there's one single motivational force for all humanity, the tendency towards self-actualization. He taught that every person has an innate tendency towards the positive development or actualization of his or her unique potential to the greatest extent possible. In addition, Persons have another innate capacity called an organismic valuing process which provides humans with the ability to choose between what will enhance personal fulfillment and what will not. Roger's theory of mental health and abnormality is that uh, it's really lack of congruence between uh, self-experience, self-concept, and the ideal self that are responsible for most of the problems with human nature. <coughs> If a child grows up in an atmosphere of unconditional positive regard and acceptance, the child will be blessed with a complete awareness of his self-actualizing tendency and value and capacity. This awareness or self-experience would constitute a reliable guide for its ongoing process of self-actualization. Um, thus, a fully functioning, skipping down, and mentally healthy individual will be one whose self-experience, self-concept, and ideal self will be congruent. Unfortunately, children rarely develop in such an open and accepting environment. The expectations and demands of parents and others make it impossible for them to achieve acceptance by relying on their instincts. These external influences cause them to deny parts of their self-experience and to develop distortions in who they perceive themselves to be and who they believe they should become. As a consequence, their internal evaluating process becomes impaired and they make choices that are poor or they are adversely affected. And uh, that's just to repeat what I said about his, his uh, belief that lack of congruence between parts of the self are responsible for most human problems, maybe even all of them. Next page. So how do you receive wholeness? Uh, Freud uh, believed that in order to have reason, you had to have insight and to be able to understand it impulses and what they're doing to you. And so therapy was largely becoming, getting, his, one of his phrases was, where it is, let ego be. There, let ego be, where it is. The more you can bring conscious awareness to your impulses, the more you can subject them to reason. If you can't do that, you can't do some reason. Okay? So, um, what happened in therapy? And I'm going to quote this. If a person in therapy gives up the guidance of an interjected value, system of values, what is to take its place? <coughs> Gradually, the person in therapy comes to experience the fact that he is making value judgments in a way that is new to him, and yet in a way that was also known to him from infancy. Just as the infant places an assured value upon an experience, relying on evidence from his own senses, 
So the client finds that it is his own organism which supplies the evidence upon which value judgment may be made. He discovers in his own senses his own physiological equipment. He can provide data for making value judgments and continuing to revise them. Now, um, I'm, I can illustrate this um, this way. I should probably do this on chairs. I don't know if, if you can see my feet back there, uh, but anyway, I'm going to just illustrate this. So all of us grow up with self-experience, okay? This is, the, the, this is the me that I truly am, who I was born to be. But because of uh, not growing up with an atmosphere of unconditional positive regard, but being grown up with uh, negative evaluations of who I am, I, I, I use the uh, illustration sometimes when I just talk to the medical students about this, that you, know, you're, you're, you, you, you grow up and you love to draw and you uh, are good at art, and, and everybody says when you're a child, wow, look at what a gift for art uh, Henry has. That's not true, but that would be an illustration. <laughs> and uh, look at what a gift for art. And, and Henry says, as he grows up, he says, I want to be an artist. What do you want to do when you grow up, Henry? Want to be an artist. And everybody thinks that's cute. And uh, my parents think that's cute. And until I get to college, and I sign up to be an art major. And then they say, well, Henry, uh, artists just come back and live in their home. They dress funny, and, uh, and they, 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 they don't get jobs. There isn't really good employment. Uh, in, in the kind of art you want to do, we think you should be a dentist. And uh, if you're a dentist, then you can make, then you can make a good living, and you can do art on the side. You, you be art, pursue art, but you don't want to be an artist. And so gradually, my sense of who I really am and my ideal self get out of whack, right? And of course, oftentimes it's over more weighty things than, than majors. But uh, but that's that's. Just an example. So let's say that my, uh, my self-experience, who I truly am, and I'm going to stand back here so you can see me. I'm going to put this down and stand on it, OK? So right now, I'm being my true self. Uh, and uh, I'm my self-experience. But because my ideal self, who I should be, is uh, different from who I really am, I develop a self-concept. That is not good because I can't be who I want to be. Okay, so if I have those three things, and I'm trying to keep them all together, I'm kind of like this. Hi, Margaret. How are you doing? Well, I'm a little uptight, but I'm okay otherwise. <laughs> and uh, I'm so self-absorbed that I don't have the energy or the the uh, cognitive smarts or the freedom to really relate to well to people and I'm acting out of this tension and doing bad, bad things, okay? But if I become fully accepted of myself so that my self-concept and my ideal self and my real self are congruent, I'm just really comfortable. I like who I am. I like who you are. Uh, everything's copacetic, okay? That's uh, a little bit of an oversimplification, but it's not much. It's really basically what the, what the theory held. So, um, go back. Now, this is, I'm going to read a couple more uh, quotes from Rogers. The extent that Rogers' confidence in the innate tendency of human beings to make good choices can be seen in the speech he delivered at Midwest College that I just referred to. And um, he said, he went on to say in that paper, we do not need to ask who will socialize him, the growing child, for one, and this is all, of course, before uh, sex, uh, sexual inclusive language was, was discovered. We do not need to ask who will socialize him for one of his own deepest needs is for affiliation and communication with others. As he becomes more fully himself, he will become more realistically socialized. We do not need to ask who will control his aggressive impulses, for as he becomes more open to all of his impulses, his need to be liked by others and his tendency to give affection will be as strong as his impulse to strike out or seize for himself. 
He will be aggressive in situations in which aggression is really realistic and appropriate, but there will be no runaway need for aggression. The only control of impulses which would exist or which would prove necessary is the natural and internal balancing of one need against another and the discovery of behaviors which follow the vector most closely approximating the satisfaction of all his needs. Now, um, then this is an amazing statement. Um, one, one thing that you have to admire, that, that you have to admire about Carl Rogers, he really worked at having his theory be uh, implemented and tried, not just on the individual counselor's couch, but in education and in international relationships. His books were published in many, many languages. Um, not just Rogers, but the schools that were built around the time, 60s, and with, with round classrooms, open classrooms, lots of things that were done were influenced by, uh, by this. Rogers' famous um, method of teaching, which I don't think students would put up today with, but he would get a group of students and he'd sit in a circle and he'd just sit there. And just sit there until the quiet became unbearable and somebody would speak. And so then he would reflect back what they spoke. And then eventually he would uh, try to get them to decide what was they wanted to talk about, what they were interested in, what did they want to learn. And uh, so, uh, he, and then uh, I'm going to read you this next quote. The implication of this aspect of our theory are such as to stretch the imagination here is a theoretical basis for sound interpersonal, intergroup, and international relationships. Stated in terms of social psychology, this proposition becomes a statement that the person or persons or group who accepts himself thoroughly will necessarily improve his relationships with those with whom he has personal contact because of his greater understanding and acceptance of them. Thus we have in effect a psychological chain reaction which appears to have tremendous potentials for the handling of problems of social support. So that's a, a strong point, right? Yeah. Now, um, Rogers was quite uh, clear in his own writings that his theory was influenced by and dependent upon, and in some ways, many ways congruent with democratic capitalism. Uh, he, he used the, the, this is way back in your history, I realize, but he used the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, as, uh, where, as, as an example in his books of where uh, people were able to uh, uh, combine self-interest and common good. But uh, this theory would not have experienced its wide and rapid acceptance if many of its ideas had not already been embedded in American political and economic philosophy. Rogers and Maslow's theories were popularized during the years immediately following World War II when the American economy was enjoying, enjoying unprecedented growth. The economic system that produced this prosperity emphasized individualism, creativity, and the conviction that the primary role of government should be largely limited to that of protecting the freedom of the citizens to pursue their own self-interest. Self-actualization theory inferred that these political and economic principles could be applied with equal success to the areas of individual and social morality. So, you see that if you're already in that kind of an economic system, it's not as big a jump to, to say, well, uh, we should, it, it, it'll work there too. Now, there's a number of strengths of Rogers' theory. Um, Carl Rogers was shown in numerous polls, well, I should say numerous, I don't know if they're numerous, but I remember a couple of large polls, of psychotherapists who asked, who was the most single in, in influential therapist for you? And Carl Rogers, far and away, was the most influential therapist at that time. It's all, he also was very influential in the field of pastoral psychology. Uh, I remember when I was at the seminary that we read a book by a man named Howard Kleinbell, who was the head of the pastoral counseling uh, part, uh, division in Claremont School of Theology. It was called Basic Types of Pastoral Counseling. 
some of our people we know. I think Daryl Bigger studied with Klein Bell and who else? A number of people uh, went and studied with Klein Bell. Um, but Klein Bell spent the first chapter in the book making a case that pastoral counselors needed to move beyond Rogerian theory, as it, which said quite a bit about how what an impact it had, because pastors were concerned about being preachy, imposing values on other people, about uh, being condemnatory, and here came a, a somebody who said, really learn to listen to people, find out what their concerns are, reflect it back to them in a non-judgmental way. Way, and they'll begin to open up more and more and become more authentic and integrated. Lots of truth in that, by the way. And his methods for achieving that are still important and still used. Uh, his, his, his methods for helping people to develop that kind of insight. So, um, any so, so I'm not going to read all those, but uh, I listed some strengths. Um, and then there, there are some problems and weaknesses in his theory. Um, take it, taken, taken in its true form, this is, it leads naturally to the externalization of responsibility for inner conflicts. So that if I have an inner conflict or if I'm neurotic or I'm whatever, uh, it can't be because of a true conflict within my true self, but because of a false self that's been put upon me by other people. Uh, in, and then, this is one that uh, Donald Browning at the University of Chicago uh, gives a philosophical objection to. He says that self-actualization theory can only work. Now, let's, let me just get abstract for a minute, but you're all abstract people. Um, if you think about human potentials, uh, let's just make them vectors or arrows. Okay? So this is my potential to affiliate to be friendly, to, uh, to do nice things, to develop, to intellect, to, to make myself uh, more intellectually informed. And he said, this theory could work if all the potentials in the universe are in harmony. But if you have other human potentials that are going this way, you're going to have collision. Right? Uh, you're going to have conflicts. And that's, that's basically boundings. Philosophical point. And then another major problem was that there's really no, it, it was really not a, something that, that had an empirical basis. And in fact, as I said earlier, personality theory is just about impossible to just to, to, to validate in terms of empirical study, whatever theory of personality you have. So, um, what, what, what people, what Rogers did was basically take values that were good and impute them back into a growing baby and, uh, and say that that was the true baby. Uh, you all know, you've heard of Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Travel. Scott Peck had a kind of a earthy response to that. He said, to do what's natural is to go to the bathroom in your pants. And, uh, he, said, <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, the whole idea that we were supposed to do what's natural. Um, but anyway, uh, near the end of his, uh, of his life, I found this in a number of years ago in a, in a journal article, and I thought it was quite remarkable. In, in the uh, textbooks on psychology, they used to have pages where B.F. Skinner would debate with Carl Rogers. And that, I remember, Carl Rogers, B.F. Skinner lined up, and they, they would go at it. And they, they uh, routinely argued. And near the end of his career, Rogers wrote something interesting. When referring to his legendary and vigorous arguments against B.F. Skinner's behaviorism, Rogers wrote, I've come to realize that the basic difference between a behavioristic approach and a humanistic approach to human beings is a philosophical choice. This can be discussed, but certainly cannot be proved on the basis of evidence. So you see the point he's making, that uh, we basically choose the nature. That was a choice that he, he made. Um, I just want to... Uh, just make a couple of sides. Um, when I when I've talked to this with uh, therapy students, it's not true now, but uh, it used to be true. When I first started teaching here, Bev, you were around at that time, and you'll remember this. Uh, 
there, there was a really strong belief that therapists needed to believe that humans were basically good. I remember the chair of the department came to me. When I first started teaching, said, Henry, we actually had a student in the MEMFAM program who was a minister, and uh, he came in and he just couldn't believe that, that, that humans were basically good. And how could you use therapy if you didn't believe that humans were basically good? And uh, so one of the things I think needs to be said um, is that to say, if somebody asks me, do you think humans are basically good? I say, well, it depends on what you mean by good. If you mean, do I think they're valuable? Absolutely, they're good. Do I think they're, they're precious and should be treated with respect and dignity? They are very good. Do I think that all of their choices left to themselves are going to be pro-social? I'm not so sure. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I think that. But oftentimes, when people, if you say people are evil or not good, it rings to people as kind of a denigrating statement. It's often said that way. Um, there, there's a, what has happened in the field of, of therapy is uh, certainly a, a recognition that, uh, that all of these theories are value-based. So what, what, what are some points for discussion? I pondered uh, when they, or Laura asked me to do this. I think there, I think there are lots of touch points to mock to issues. Uh, and one of them, some of them are, are uh, controversial today, but I think that we, they still need to be asked. And the first point on the very back is, what is a Christian response to our cultural emphasis on the pursuit of self-interest? Is it possible in today's political climate to articulate a Christian response to, for example, the widening gap between rich and poor? Karl Marx, uh, who is a philosopher, uh, you know, and Marxism has certainly been shown to be destructive and, and not work. But Marx pointed out to what he thought were some fundamental contradictions in pure capitalistic economic theory. And one of them was this. And I've never heard a good answer to this by my friends who are very, that capitalism emphasizes the maximization of production, the proficiency of production, with, at the same time, cutting production costs and leaving them as low as you possibly can, minimizing production costs, right? You, you get as much as you can produce, you keep your production costs as low as you can. And what Marx said was, inevitably, this leads to a gap between rich and poor. Because once you get to a certain place, the wealthy have no reason to help the poor do anything but work for the less, least amount possible. Uh, and that that becomes uh, in, in, entrenched. And yet, today, and I'm giving broad generalizations, but there, there's, there are a lot of people in the Christian community today who, who make statements like this. I, I, I happen to like golf. I used to play. I don't play much well, but I still like to watch it. Now, if you need a fast sport like basketball or football, I want to invite you to watch golf. <laughs> golf is played on beautiful, flowery green fairways and greens, and people that have their hair done well, or they, they walk around, and they, they, they look good, <laughs> and, uh, and they have to shoot this ball with amazing accuracy. I played enough golf to know how hard it is to be 200 yards out and land something within 10 yards of the pin. I mean, that's just amazing. So, I, that's my appeal to watch golf. But uh, I like to watch golf, and one of the golfers who is uh, on the LPGA circuit today, Catherine Kirk, is, uh, she was Catherine Hall now. She got married to an American. She's Catherine Kirk. Catherine Kirk's a little bit like Tim Tebow was in football, and that Catherine Kirk is very upfront about her Christian faith. She even writes John 3.16 on her golf ball. And I remember watching her when she was leading in a tournament, and they'd zero on her ball in the green, John 3.16, right down her golf ball. And uh, so I'm, her Christian faith is very, very important. Her website is quite full of statements like this. She quotes John Stossel quoting Ayn Rand, okay? Americans' abundance was created not by public sacrifices to the common good, but by the productive genius of free men who pursue their own personal self-interest and the making of their own private fortunes. That's what made America great. Not by public sacrifices to the common good, but by the productive genius of free men. 
And then Rand goes on to say, they did not starve the people to pay for America's industrialization. They gave the people better jobs, higher wages, and cheaper goods with every new machine they invented. The, one of the problems is that citizens and media frequently express outrage when political leaders put self-interest to the benefits of local constituents above the larger society, while at the same time holding to the pursuit that the pursuit of self-interest is a primary obligation, at least. Now, so the question is, and I, I'm, I'm going to give you another question so we don't have to talk, talk about this, but is it p possible in today's political climate to articulate a Christian response to the widening gap between rich and poor? Is, is that even possible in, in today's polarized climate to talk about that? I hope it is, uh, but uh, it has to be done in, with lots of preparation. And, and, and there's, there are areas in which wise, good people can differ on some of those issues, no question about it. There's another question which goes in a different direction that I think this whole area leads to. And I want to then turn to C.S. Lewis. Um, I pointed out already that Rogers and Lewis and, and Freud had as their starting points this inner tension inside the person, inner psychic sense of shame, or, or use what different words, not measuring up, guilt from the oppressive superego, uh, or, or a, a self a concept or, or a ideal self that's out of alignment with the true self. <clears throat> um, C.S. Lewis did the same. If you remember in Mere Christianity, first five books, the very title of the first five books is The Right and Wrong as a Clue to the Meaning of the Universe. And Lewis gives the moral argument for God in which he says there's, he makes a case that there's evidence that people have a conscience. You can't explain it by, uh, by just natural causes. It, 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 and, and that all over the world, people, when they argue, they're arguing for some standard and that they're not violating that some standard. And if you ask where that standard come from, uh, he, he argues that there's a sense of right and wrong. And then he ends that, that last fifth, the last, I think there's five chapters in book one of Mere Christianity. And if I, as I remember it, and I'm quoting it pretty closely, he says, once a human being recognizes that there is a moral law that they are subject to and believe in, and that they are out of harmony with that law and can't keep it, then and only then does Christianity begin to talk. Get that point? Once Christianity doesn't begin to talk until we realize that we should live a certain way, and we're not doing it. And that's when Christianity begins to talk. Now, I think, I'm not equating Lewis's idea of, of, uh, and, and Freud's and Rogers exactly, but from a, from a psychological, inner psychic experience, and actual perspective, I think it's really significant that all three of those figures had as a starting point this inner tension that we live with. I, I think it's shame. Let's call it shame. Uh, technical people have different shames for words for shame and guilt, but I like the word shame because it's in Genesis, and it's the very first emotion that people felt, uh, one of the first after the fall. Uh, so, so, uh, so that's where they start. So my question is this: today, people seem to be in, increasingly not really resonating with concepts like sin and guilt against God. They, they don't, they, there's a great sense of inadequacy. One of the reasons Brene Brown is so popular with her emphasis, and, and I, I love her, but you know, is, is this, is, is in no one way, she's talking this sense that we, we don't measure up. And, and what do we do about it? So, is there, what would be a Christian response to that aspect of the human condition today? Is it the same one that Luther articulated and that Calvin articulated uh, in terms of redemption from guilt? Yeah, I'm going to be quiet. Thank you. Yes, Donna. Okay. Uh, to your first question about Christian response and tension mm -hmm. to what we see in the world, it seems to me that, look, sort of stepping back, that there's always a... Uh, 
Okay, now I have to say things really carefully, huh? <laughs> uh, no, it seems to me there's always a tension between liberty and equality, and in a sense, the Christian response has to, you know, I look at this and I see that Anne Rand is sort of right, but so is Karl Marx. Uh, and, and so a Christian response is kind of a balance. Um, one of the basic problems, I think, is the system we have set up tries to maximize liberty, which I, we all agree with, otherwise we wouldn't be able to be here. But uh, it also does tend to lead, lead to uh, imbalances and inequities on, on a larger scale. So the Christian response, if Jesus says, you know, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and I think that somewhere uh, at a, there's a fulcrum, a place where the balance has to, has to occur, and, and that fulcrum moves uh, through time and circumstance. So the balance at the time that our system was set up may be different from, it was different, uh, and it was affected by a whole set, set of things historically. But the, the last thing I say, in the legal world, Henry Ford, and he got mentioned in the sermon this morning, if you happen to hear Brandy, I thought that was very, very interesting. Uh, Henry Ford tried to implement uh, a charitable uh, arm, so to speak, or to use proceeds from the profit of the profits that he made through Ford Motor Company. And he got brought down the stock, by the stockholders and the court and the purpose of a corporation is not to serve the greater good. The purpose of the corporation is to serve the stockholders, mm -hmm. to make a profit for the people who have invested. And that principle underlies our whole system, at least in this country, mm -hmm. and in, in many others. So we, you have to sort of balance that with what might be a corporate duty to the greater good. I'm not sure. No, I, I think that's profoundly said. The one thing that I would ask, because that's often, is setting up freedom and equality the right dichotomy? Or, or should it be freedom and some, some level of, of security and some, some level of, of opportunity? Uh, I, when, when people say equality, it sounds like it's communism or socialism. We all have to have the same amount. Uh, so I would hope the balance would not be between freedom and equality, but freedom and some area of social justice or security. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Peter. Uh, thank you, Henry, for your interesting presentation. I try to be very quick because there is a lot to say about this. Mm -hmm. You brought a lot of uh, thought, uh, I mean, food for thought for us. Well, first, let me start with uh, Karl Marx that you mentioned uh, lately. Well, he was a hypocrite because uh, uh, in Germany, after he was expelled from Germany for his communistic ideas, he took refuge in England, and he was supported by his uh, good friend Friedrich Engels. Well, Engels was uh, the owner of a textile factory, and uh, he supported uh, Marx uh, all his life and helped him to, to write his Das Kapital and other, other writings. But he was a hypocrite. I mean, he benefited from the, the, the prosperity of capitalism. Now, in regard to this equality that uh, it's a lot of talk about, uh, it cannot be equality. Even the societies that believe, like communist society, believe that uh, they, uh, they came in power with this slogan, uh, didn't accomplish equality because... Well, and that's why I don't like the contrast to equality, because... Uh, but, uh, but keep going. And why not? It's not possible. Because people do not have the same mental power, they do not have the same physical strength, mm -hmm. They do not have the same drive to accomplish something. They don't have the same creativity and so forth and so on. We are not equal. We don't have the same power, mental and physical power. Then we cannot, we cannot uh, try to accomplish something like that. That is very utopian. It is not accomplishable and is creating a lot of disappointed in people. Yeah. Um, 
The second thing, uh, quickly, I try to, to take on. You mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, you introduced the concept of wholeness. Well, I believe when we are talking about wholeness, we are talking not about a person that is physically held, uh, in good health, but also uh, mentally. And, uh, of course, uh, here we introduce the concept of morality, which is very close to forming a personality that you are mentioning. And of course, uh, uh, we have to, to start uh, talking about the two concepts about, uh, about the person, first of all. Christianity believed that people were, uh, the people were born in sin, and that uh, Apostle Paul mentioned that th this was transmitted. He said, I want to do good, I cannot do it, because the evil that is inside me. But the Enlightenment came up with this idea that you mentioned that uh, people can, uh, are born uh, good eventually uh, and uh, even they can improve uh, through education. And we have, we have in this uh, regard two, the two great uh, people of the 16th century, Martin Luther and uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam, that, that was considered a prince of humanism. Erasmus believed that people I in... I want to just see if you can... I'm sorry, there's a number of hands up, but I want to hear... I think what you're saying is very important. I just... Please finish that talk. Well, quickly, let me... Okay. No, no. Okay. Yeah, well, Erasmus believed exactly in line with the Enlightenment people that uh, uh, you can uh, improve uh, through, through education. Mm -hmm. uh, Luther believed that we are... Our nature is so bad that... God help us, he is the only capable to help us to get out of this situation. Now, in regard to, to morality, well, uh, C.S. Lewis that you mentioned, uh, he, uh, he defined that a moral person is some, somebody that is thinking and acting in a moral way. But the Christian morality, it's a little bit different, it's going one step further. And that means to be like God. And uh, an example, Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount, he, when he was mentioning the minimum requirements, mentioning the commandments, these are minimum requirements because when he said you should not kill, he went beyond that. Not only to kill physically a person, but you should not call him name, insults, and respect him, and so forth. And I will stop here. I want okay, to thank, thank you, Daniel. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and then, and then, and then, yes. You know, I, th I think it's been widely um, pointed out by many philosophers that um, a um, system in which freedom and liberty are espoused would lead to the results that uh, come from the French Revolution. I think that's a perfect example. And, and all philosophers, generally speaking, have been very uh, uh, negative about the kind of freedom that we enjoy today. And so I, I, I this is a personal thought I've had, is why did the Enlightenment in England occur and why did it work so well? And why did the American Revolution work so well? And, and I've wondered whether the kind of liberty England enjoyed was because of the um, Wesleyan and, and, and movements like that, that that gave a basis for liberty to be um, espoused. And I wonder whether in America, uh, the Second Great Awakening came right about at the right time to give sort of the, the, um, the, the kind of basis in which you could begin to practice egalitarian types of activities. And, and, and in a society like, not, like we have now, where we've abandoned uh, uh, a basic concept of, of God, uh, I, I think we're probably doomed to uh, the kind of uh, f fractioning of society that we see today. Thank you. And I want to, I, 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 boy, there's lots of things. I, I want to, one thing I want to, uh, I'm interested in, in framing is, I think what, what we often do when we try to uh, bring about common good outcomes, is find the right balance of ways to appeal or bring about personal uh, gain and self-interest and balance that with can you somehow get common good out of that and uh, that's where uh, that, that's a whole other discussion I, 
I think there are ways in which that can be done to some extent. Yes, next. Well, then, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't want to forget no, that. No, no, I, I understand that. I have a point about uh, C.S. Lewis and um, when Christianity begins to talk, that quote reminded me of Antigone and natural law. Remember when she was supposed to die if she buried her brother? And Antigone said to Creon, said, what do you think? I don't care about what your edicts are. There's a law greater than your law that dictates my kindness to my brother. Remember that? Um, no, I don't, but I should. But I, <laughs> I think Antigone is a representation of our belief in, um, I mean, the, the Greeks' belief in natural law that it precedes every other law that we put in our, in our systems, our codified law. It's way beyond that. And I think that's what uh, Christ was referring to and that's what C.S. Lewis talks about. It's, yeah, and that's you. the struggle. Thank it's. you. I, 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 I think it's interesting. Uh, if you happen to have read or see or Francis Collins' book, The Language of God, Francis Collins started the, the, the director of the, now the NIH and, and certainly a top scientist. He's a Theraguayan evolutionist and, and even a random evolution, but he calls himself a Christian, did call himself an evangelical Christian before it became kind of a tainted word. And he really attributes his conversion to C.S. Lewis's argument for the moral argument of God, which he couldn't account for uh, with uh, on the basis of, uh, of evolution. What? What are you going to do with the advancement of neuroscience? You, you, can, you can find your consciousness, it's in a few cells in some place in the brain, and destroy that and conscience leaves. So I'm I'm where does with, the natural yeah. goodness arise? I don't know. I'm blissfully ignorant on that one. No, I'm saying, no I, think it's a very, I, I think it's a very good question. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Hank. And Jerry, we're going to have to have you come back and talk about your multi-academy experience. Really not worth it. It fits very well into sin and guilt and absolution. <laughs> okay, now uh, see, next week, Peter, are you up? Okay. That's me. And your topic is? Uh, physical, uh, the philosophical roots uh, of uh, wholeness. Okay. Men. And then the following week, Rodney, I think, you're up. Well, Rodney's the last Sabbath of June. Oh. I forgot there are oh. five Sabbaths, so we have oh, a blank on Okay, so we got, okay. So we'll but, work on that. But anyway, uh, Hank, thank you very much for the presentation. Very thought stimulating. And, uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, at this time, let's have our benediction. And you'll be up here so people can pay your, by the hour, is that the way you do that? That's what therapists do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.